Most likely no one will ever threaten to throw you into a fiery furnace or a den of lions because of your faith in Jesus Christ. But none of us get through this life without a trial of faith. We can all benefit from the example of people like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who were taken captive as young men by the mighty Babylonian Empire. These young people were surrounded by an unfamiliar culture with different values, and they faced great temptations to abandon their beliefs and righteous traditions. Yet they remained true in their covenants, like Joseph in Egypt and Esther in Persia, Daniel and his friends in Babylon kept their faith in God, and God worked miracles that still inspire believers to this day. How did they find the strength to remain so faithful? They did those small and simple things that God has asked all of us to do, praying, fasting, choosing good friends, trusting in God, and being a light to others. As we are strengthened by doing these same small and simple things, we can face the lions and fiery furnaces in our own lives with faith. Yeah, I was going to say, maybe we ought to review just a little bit of the historical context. Uh, we're talking of the period of time right around 600 B.C., so this is kind of in a Book of Mormon setting. In fact, Daniel's probably much the same age as like Laman, Lemuel, and Nephi. Mm -hmm. uh, because he was a young lad around 605, 606 B.C. when he was taken from Judea to Babylon. And uh, it was a time when the Babylonians were regaining control of Mesopotamia from the Assyrians and had defeated, had conquered Nineveh, had defeated the Assyrians, were moving into this area of the Fertile Crescent where Judea was, in fact, were uh, about ready to put their own puppet king on the throne mm -hmm. and so forth. And so they were bringing some of the best and brightest, I guess we would say, of the Judean youth to Babylon. Uh, it's kind of like getting a special all-expenses-paid scholarship <laughs> to go to Babylon, which I guess is exciting for those that went and may have disappointed. I, I just wonder if, if Daniel was new and, and was known by some of Lehi's family and if some of Lehi's boys were maybe just a little jealous or upset that they didn't get to go. Of course, their destiny would be much different and, mm -hmm. and, and great in another dimension. Mm -hmm. When Daniel, the, this judge of God, as his name means, with his friends and others were, were taken to the court of, of the king of Babylon. Mm -hmm. we, may, we may want to point out, too, that, uh, that what they're there, that the reason the king's taken them there is to make sure that everybody at home minds their P's and Q's. Yes, this was an well, offer that was yeah. too good to be it's true, it's and every time it was a little a hook, right. uh, it was, we'd like to have your best and brightest. We'll give them all of these wonderful things. It sounds like just, oh, it's too good to be true. But once they're there, then they can say, now, you leaders back there in Judah, you better follow us and do what we say or you're never going to see your son again. Yeah, right. That was and, the hook. Yeah, and part of it is the expectation. They're not getting free education. The Babylonians would have taken Israelites and other conquered people, trained some of their youth, and then say, now you work for us in the administration of our empire. Sure. So, pretty, uh, pretty mm -hmm. typical. It's self-serving here. This, is, this isn't to be nice to Daniel yeah, and his yeah, friends. That's right. Right. It wasn't all the vacation that we're cracking it up to be. The book of Daniel begins with the nation of Babylon raiding Jerusalem and the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar beginning a new program to educate captured Hebrew children. And the king spake unto Aspenaz, the master of the, his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel and of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom there was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science and such has had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank. So nourishing three years that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. What do you think of King Nebuchadnezzar's plan? What might be the motives behind such a program?
total commitment. To make deliberate and wise decisions to live in God's will day by day, we must make a heart decision to honor God in all we do. Here's Gene. Perhaps Daniel in the Old Testament illustrates this principle more than any other Old Testament character. We see this in relationship to a decision that he had to make. And it was a heart decision. It was a difficult decision. And one of his goals was to honor God in everything that he did. Now here's the setting. Here we have Nebuchadnezzar's selective process. The king ordered Aspenaz, the chief of his court officials, to bring some of the Israelites from the royal family and from the nobility, young men without any physical defect or good looking. In other words, this was the command that Nebuchadnezzar gave to Aspenaz when they went into Jerusalem and when they had those conversations probably with Jehoiakim. And I, I, I personally believe that Jehoiakim, to save his own neck, actually helped Aspenaz pick out these young men. Daniel was included, his three friends, but, and we don't know how many young men, but they were all uh, from the king's palace. They were all very bright men, young men. Uh, Daniel and his friends were probably 15 years old. So we're talking about young men. And notice it describes they were suitable for instruction in all wisdom, knowledgeable, perceptive, I, I, I really wonder if they had taken an intelligence test, what their IQ scores would be. They were brilliant. And not only were they good looking and physically fit, but intellectually, they were brilliant. Psychologically, they were balanced. They were the best young men of the kingdom and from the royal palace. So we read that because of these qualifications, they were to be taught, and we read on here, and to teach them the Chaldean language and literature. Now think about that. First of all, they had to learn the language. And that is, is going to be a tough situation. But they're going to be taught. And in the university, as it were, in the Babylonian area, this was probably the best education you could ever have, but it was all pagan. All pagan. And so we read here that these men were chosen. They were taken against their will, obviously. But we read about their life in Babylon. Verse 5. The king assigned them daily provisions from the royal food and from the wine that he drank. In other words, he's got great plans for these brilliant young men. He's going to train them in all of the academia of, of the Babylonians, all of the religious teachings regarding the pagan gods. They were to be trained for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to serve in the king's court. In other words, they were to have a three-year education. It would be like having a three-year compact education that would lead to a Ph.D. But they were only 15 years old, but they were brilliant. And so they went into this training program. They were given new pagan names. And notice we read, among them from the descendants of Judah were Daniel... Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them other names. He gave the name Belteshazzar to Daniel, Shadrach to Hananiah, Meshach to Mishael, and Abednego to Azariah. Now, if you compare their Jewish names, you will find that their Jewish names honored God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But Nebuchadnezzar, through his officials, gave them all pagan names, and every one of these names referred to pagan gods. In other words, he, they wanted to eliminate any aspects of the religion and the faith of the Jews who believed in one God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So they had new names. But here is where Daniel and his three friends face a tremendous challenge. I call this Daniel's heart decision. Daniel 1.8. Daniel determined that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine he drank. 
So he asked permission from the chief official not to defile himself. Now, the problem here was not the king's food per se, though there may have been foods that the Jews felt were unclean. But that wasn't the primary problem. It wasn't the wine. The problem was that this food and this wine had been offered to pagan gods. And in the context of immorality, paganism, immorality. And so Daniel purposed in his heart that he didn't want to be associated with any aspect of idolatry or immorality. But he had a problem. How is he going to deal with this issue? I, I like to think in terms of the fact that Daniel was, was selective in terms of his battles. For example, we have no written uh, recognition that he was troubled by the fact they changed his name. He could handle that. But when it came to eating that food that was offered to idols, that was the line he just couldn't go over. But here is where you see his wisdom as a 15-year-old. Rather than trenching in and being obstinate, he asked permission. He was very sensitive. This is wisdom. In other words, how can I win this battle and not lose a war? And so we see this happening in this, this young man's life. Prove thy servants. But Daniel proposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, and it was the meat that was offered to idols, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king who hath appointed your meat and your drink, for why should he see your faces worse lightning, liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall ye make me endanger my head to the king. Then said Daniel to Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse. It's edible dry beans, uh, peas, and lentils, for example, to eat, and water to drink. Let our countenances be looked upon before thee, and the countenances of the children that eat at the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter, and proved them ten days. And at the end of ten days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in the flesh than all the children which did eat the portions of the king's meat. David R. Stone of the Quorum of the Seventy said the following, We see Babylon in our cities. We see Babylon in our communities. We see Babylon everywhere. And with the encroachment of Babylon, we have to create Zion in the midst of it. We should not allow ourselves to be engulfed by the culture which surrounds us. We seldom realize the extent to which we are a product of the culture of our place and time. Daniel and his brothers refused to do that which they believed to be wrong. However, much the Babylonian culture believed to be right. And for that fidelity and courage, the Lord blessed them and gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. Wherever we are, whatever city we may live in, we can build our own Zion by the principles of the celestial kingdom and ever seek to become the pure in heart. Zion is the beautiful, and the Lord holds it in his own hands. Our homes can be places which are a refuge and protection as Zion is. We do not need to become as puppets in the hands of the culture of the place and time. We can be courageous and can walk in the Lord's paths and follow his footsteps. And if we do, we will be called Zion and we will be the people of the Lord. Daniel's life testifies that the people who keep God's health code will be blessed with special wisdom. Daniel, after keeping God's health code, is able to interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream 
and receive many revelations about the future. Daniel was a representative of the house of Israel, and his life shows that God's people can, by keeping God's health laws, such as the word of wisdom found in D&C section 89, receive special wisdom or revelation. This promise is fulfilled in the prophets of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints continue to be blessed with revelation to guide us as a people through the difficult challenges in these latter days. But the promise is also to individual saints. We can also receive special wisdom and personal revelation according to our desires to understand our efforts and the Lord's will in our own lives. The courage to stand firm with God. King Nebuchadnezzar builds a golden idol and commands everyone in his kingdom to worship it on a regular schedule announced by musical instruments. The penalty for non-compliance is burning to death in a fiery furnace. Ananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, their Babylonian names were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, did not comply. Sharon G. Larson, second counselor in the Young Women General Presidency, gave a talk called Standing with God back in March of 2000. She says the following, Can you imagine the courage of these young men? No threats from the king could dissuade them. With faith in their God, they stood together and prayed as they were bound and carried to be burned. What does it mean to stand as a witness of God? It means we will not bow down or give in or be persuaded to do anything contrary to God's will. It means we will risk speaking up when our knees are shaking. It means we will listen and follow the still, small voice of the Holy Ghost. The story of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being cast into a fiery furnace is also replicated in two other books, the Book of Jasher and in the Book of Mormon. And in the Book of Jasher, we have Abram and his brother Haran being cast into the fire. And they were there for three days and three nights. And the God of heaven and earth, in whom I trust and whom has all power, he delivered me. In other words, they were saved because of their faith. And in the Book of Mormon, in the Book of Alma, we have Alma and Amulek. They are also cast into fire. And they were there for three days. And the Lord had granted them power to be delivered. So all these stories show that in having faith in Christ, he can deliver you from any situation, including something as horrendous as being cast into a fire. Daniel was a type of Christ. Daniel, like all ancient prophets, bore witness through types of Jesus the Christ. His experience in overcoming the jaws of death by lions bore witness of Christ, who would overcome death for us all. Daniel was put to die in a tomb-like den filled with beasts signifying death. The den, like Jesus' tomb, was sealed like with a stone. Yet in the morning Daniel lived, foreshadowing Christ's resurrection. In Daniel chapter 6, verse 24, bones were broken of his accusers. None of Daniel's or Christ's bones were broken. Daniel's preservation from death was due to his righteousness. Innocency was found in me. I have done no hurt. Not only was Jesus perfectly innocent, but he was literally the Son of God. Did you know that the prophetic dream that Nebuchadnezzar had in Daniel chapter 2 could have potential implications for us today? The dream featured a huge statue of a man whose splendor was excellent and its form was awesome. And the head of the statue was of gold, its chest and arms of silver, its belly and thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, and his feet partly of iron and partly of clay. Each section represented a kingdom, and the head of gold was one of those kingdoms of Babylon, ruled by Nebuchadnezzar himself. The second section, the chest and arms of silver, was to be a second inferior kingdom, which we are told in Daniel 5 was the Medo-Persian Empire. 
The third kingdom, the belly and thighs of bronze, was Greece, ruled by Alexander the Great. And the fourth kingdom, the legs of iron, was undoubtedly Rome. The fifth kingdom, however, is the feet of iron and clay. And that is the kingdom that will be smashed by the rock, bringing down all the other kingdoms before it. Daniel 2, 34. Now, while opinions differ on who this last empire is, most Christians believe that this is to be the Antichrist kingdom, the final kingdom, which is spoken of in Revelation chapter 17, verses 12 and 13. Here, the Antichrist leads a coalition of 10 nations, which is in verse 14, is defeated by Christ, who then sets up his eternal kingdom, where the kingdoms of the world become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. Revelation 11, 15. Jesus said there will be signs to help us identify the time of the end and of his return. We can rely on the prophetic picture of the statue in Daniel to tell us what the nature of this last kingdom will be. Partly strong with attributes of the Iron Kingdom, of Rome for example, and yet with clear weaknesses that come from a divided kingdom. Does this sound familiar? Our hope is secure though. As the book of Daniel in chapter 2, verse 44, finishes this particular prophecy with these words. And in the days of these kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to another people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. Inasmuch as you saw that the stone was cut out of a mountain without hands, and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what will come to pass after this. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is sure. The implications to us in this generation is that we are in that last ruling power and we need to be aware that Christ's kingdom is soon to come. So let's review the interpretation of the great image. The gold head was Babylon, the power in Daniel's time, ruling from about 605 to 538 BC. The silver breast and arms were the Medes and Persians who ruled from 538 to 533 BC. The brass, belly, and thighs, the Greeks split into four separate powers, but were dominated by the Potomese, which were found there where the red circle is, and the Seleucids. You can see the Seleucid Empire in the next circle. They ruled from 332 to 161 BC. The kingdom of iron was Rome. Its two legs showed eventual division into an eastern and a western empire. Rome ruled 161 BC to 476 AD, and the feet with their ten toes represent the modern kingdoms which arose out of the Roman Empire, most of them existing down into our own modern times. The stone shall roll forth until it has filled the whole earth. We read this in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 65. This was given to Joseph on October 30th in 1831. Hearken and lo, a voice is one sent down from on high, who is mighty and powerful, whose going forth is unto the ends of the earth, yea, whose voice is unto all men. Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. The keys of the kingdom of God are committed unto man on the earth, and from thence shall the gospel roll forth unto the ends of the earth. As the stone which is cut out of the mountain without hand shall roll forth until it has filled the whole earth. The Church of Christ was organized April 6, 1830, with only six members. Then in early 1834, there was a gathering held in Kirtland, Ohio. Brother Truman Matson described what was said at the meeting. Quote, Wilford Woodruff says the building was a log cabin, maybe 12 or 14 feet square and that those who assembled were most of the priesthood brethren who had been ordained in the church. Each in turn bore a five-minute testimony at the prophet's request. Please, Joseph said, brethren, bear your testimony as to what you see as the future of this church. They did their best, and then Joseph arose and said, in effect, I have enjoyed what you've said, 
but you no more comprehend the destinies of this of this church one version is that then a little child on his mother's lap and another version says then a babe on his mother's arm the point joseph was making was that these leaders didn't begin to comprehend the great and fulfilling destiny of the restored church of jesus christ then he said it will fill eventually brethren north and south america and then eventually the whole earth. The stone cut out of the mountain without hands rolls forth. At the April 6th conference in 1976, President Spencer Deputy Kimball gave an address called The Stone Cut Without Hands, in which he marveled that the church now had members in 66 nations. We have 23,000 plus missionaries, he added. We have 750 stakes, and whereas we had only a little more than a score of missions when I fulfilled my mission, we now have 134. At the October conference in 2007, President Gordon B. Hinckley gave an address entitled The Stone Cut Out of the Mountain, in which he declared there are now more than 13 million of us and 176 nations and territories. In the 2019 statistical report, there were over 67,000 missionaries serving in 399 missions around the world. President Kimball's reference to 750 stakes in 1976 have grown to 3,437. In the 2021 statistical report, there were 54,539 missionaries serving in 407 missions, 3,498 stakes, 16,850,000 members, and 170 temples in operation. In the 2022 report, there were 173 dedicated temples, 53 under construction, and 56 announced giving a total of 282 temples. And this is a map that gives you an idea. If you look at the world and where the temples are located, they're now dotting North and South America. They're into Europe, even into Africa and Asia and Australia and New Zealand. So the church continues to grow. It is that stone cut out of the mountain without hands that's rolling forth and consuming other nations. I bear witness that this is the truth, and I say it in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.